Thank you. We turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Presiding officer, as this is our last session of FMQs before Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday, I'm sure we all want to pay tribute and express our gratitude to those who sacrificed their lives for the way of life that we all today value. Uh, later today, I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davison. I'd like to uh, associate myself and my party with the message of the First Minister. Presiding officer, I know that events elsewhere in the world are taking precedence uh, right now in the news, but I believe that this Parliament has a job in holding this Government to account. In March, we discovered that the Scottish Government had signed a £10 billion memorandum of understanding with two Chinese companies. And we only discovered it because a picture appeared in the Chinese trade press. We learned this week that the deal had now collapsed, and we only learned of that thanks to the Scottish Sunday Papers. Does the First Minister think that this is the mark of a transparent government? First Minister. Well, this government is focused on one of our core responsibilities, which is trying to attract jobs and investment to Scotland. That is something I will never apologise for. That was the whole purpose that underpinned the memorandum of understanding that Ruth Davidson refers to. That memorandum did not commit us to any particular investment, but it did commit us to exploring opportunities for such investment. Now, we were made aware in August that due to the political climate, uh, our partners in that memorandum of understanding felt that they could not proceed at this time. We did not take that as a cancellation uh, of the memorandum of understanding. We remained committed then, as we remain committed now, to pursuing all opportunities for investment. I regret the fact that the partners uh, do now consider uh, the memorandum of understanding to be cancelled. But I would end by saying this. Uh, the reason for that is the political climate that was created. And while, as First Minister, I will certainly... I will certainly reflect on any lessons the Scottish Government uh, should learn from this experience, but I hope, and I say this sincerely and genuinely, I hope the opposition parties will also reflect on this, because scrutiny and questions of course are legitimate. I agree with Ruth Davidson that the opposition's job is to hold this government to account, but I think all opposition parties uh, should be careful not to create a climate in this country that is seen to be inhospitable to investment. Because if that happens, then that is not good for our economy or for any of us. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister is demanding that the rest of us take responsibility for a deal that we didn't even know existed. And the Parliament would have scrutinised the deal if she hadn't hid it from the Parliament. Uh, Presiding officer, the First Minister might have answered a question, but once again, it wasn't the question that she was actually asked. So let me answer that for her. It is not the mark of a transparent government. It is not the mark of a transparent government. It is the mark of a government whose first instinct is to duck and dive and think that it can escape scrutiny when it wants to. This is a government which even tries to hide which of its MSPs backs Brexit. Yeah. Now, <laughs> presiding officer... Presiding officer, the double standards that we have from this shower are extraordinary. The First Minister's former Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead, said the other way that it was unacceptable that the UK government should do deals without full disclosure. And yet here we have a Scottish government that didn't tell us the Chinese deal was on and it failed to tell us when it was called off. And we've already just heard the excuse that it was the opposition parties daring to ask questions. So can I ask her in all seriousness, is it really her position that the collapse of this deal is everybody else's fault and nothing to do with her government? First Minister. Firstly, if, if she cared to listen to what I said, I said that I, as First Minister, would reflect on any lessons we had to learn from this experience. And I say that again. Secondly, let me repeat the fact that this memorandum of understanding was a commitment to build relationships and to explore opportunities. It was not actually a commitment to any particular investment. That's why I do think uh, the charge of double standards from Ruth Davidson is actually a bit staggering because Ruth Davidson is the representative of a party that has uh, apparently made commitments to Nissan and yet refuses to publish the letter telling us what those commitments are. Commitments that may actually carry a price tag 
for the taxpayer. So I would suggest Ruth Davidson perhaps uh, concentrates on getting the, the house of her own party in order before she comes here uh, to uh, lecture the Scottish Government. But in terms of the wider issues of Brexit, I have to say uh, there is certainly no secrecy around who in the Tory benches supports Brexit, because they all support Brexit now, regardless of what they might have said before, before the referendum. But I don't think I don't think the Conservatives have got any party uh, any uh, excuse to lecture anybody when it comes to trade and investment. Because let's not forget, the Conservative Party is the one that wants to rip Scotland out of the EU, out of the single market against our will, and that's what's going to have such a damaging impact on jobs and investment in this country. Ruth Davison. President officer, I cannot believe that the First Minister is persisting to come to the Chamber today to say that the Chinese Communist Party pulled the plug in this deal because they heard the Scottish Liberal Democrats roar. Uh, it's just... <laughs> This entire saga is embarrassing. It is embarrassing for this government, and I think it's embarrassing for our country. Because if we spell out what actually was at stake here, or what we're now being told was at stake here, because it was hidden at the time, it was £10 billion that could have been invested in housing and transport. And that's exactly the kind of investment that you would expect the Scottish government to pull out all the stops to secure. So given that, wouldn't you have expected at least one just one of the First Minister's ministerial team to have picked up the phone to the potential investors after me to make sure that the deal was still on track. Why wasn't that call made? First Minister. Well, we continue to engage not just with the partners in this deal, but with anybody that we consider uh, could lead to investment in Scotland. That's part of our core responsibilities. But it's a bit rich, is it not? Uh, for oppositions to stand here today and complain about a deal, which was actually a memorandum of understanding to explore potential deals, collapsing uh, when for weeks during and after uh, the May Scottish Parliament elections, uh, we repeatedly had opposition parties uh, from this yeah. chamber demanding that the whole thing was cancelled. So they demanded that it was cancelled and then they've got the nerve to come here and uh, say all these things are saying about uh, the fact that the situation has developed as it has. That, I think, is double standards and that, I think, is staggering hypocrisy. So we will concentrate as a government on making sure that we focus on our job of doing everything we can to create jobs, investment and trade in and for Scotland. And that's even more important now than it ever has been before, given the fact that Ruth Davidson's party is determined to take us out of the European Union against our will. Ruth Davidson. Again, not answering the question I asked about what calls were made by ministers to try and save this deal. And according to John Swinney, on the record, he says there have been no discussions between the First Minister or other ministers and the Chinese investors since me. Presiding officer, this is a government which loves to preach from its high horse, but it can't face up to evidence of its own incompetence. Let's recap. They failed to tell us a deal was signed. They did nothing to keep it going. They failed to tell us when it collapsed. And it's all everybody else's fault. But there is an important question here about what happens now. In 2012, the SNP published a strategy for engagement between Scotland and China to double the number of major Chinese investors here by 2017 and to position Scotland as a base for Chinese investment. If this government wants to bring forward transparent, well-thought-out plans for Chinese inward investment, then they can expect a fair hearing. But rather than blaming us, or blaming Brexit, or blaming the weather, will the First Minister remove the shroud of secrecy from deals like these and actually be straight with the Scottish people? First Minister. Look, Ruth Davidson is absolutely entitled to ask questions of this government, but to talk about a shroud of secrecy when her party is refusing to publish the details of the commitments that have been given to Nissan, frankly, is double standards on stilts. Now, in terms of uh, how this government will uh, proceed, we will continue uh, to try to attract investment from China, uh, from other countries, from anywhere that wants to invest in Scotland in reasonable uh, investment proposals. That is our job. Now, I will end uh, this exchange where I started. Uh, I and this government will reflect on lessons we need to learn from this experience. That is important, and I accept responsibility for that. But, you know, we have an opposition that demanded the cancellation 
of this memorandum of understanding. We had an opposition that had a hysterical, over-the-top reaction to this memorandum of understanding. So while, yes, I take responsibility for learning lessons, I really do think the opposition also have to reflect eh, on their behaviour, which led to a political climate in which these partners felt that they couldn't proceed. So perhaps if we all do that, eh, we might be in a better position in the future. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Can I associate myself and these benches with the First Minister's remarks regarding Remembrance Sunday and ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet? First Minister. The Cabinet will next meet on Tuesday. Kezia Dugdale. Today is Equal Pay Day. From today until the end of the year, women are essentially working for free. An equal pay day comes just one day after the most experienced presidential candidate in American history, who just happened to be a woman, was defeated by the least qualified candidate ever. We still have so much to do to break the glass ceiling that women face. Donald Trump's behaviour towards women sends a dangerous signal across the world. So what steps is the First Minister taking to make Scotland a fairer and safer place for women? First Minister. Well, I think uh, Kezia Dugdale is uh, right to raise this issue. I, as I said yesterday, uh, regret the result of the uh, US election. It was not the outcome I wanted, but I do respect the verdict of the American people. But Hil Hillary Clinton's defeat yesterday, uh, amongst many other things, perhaps tells us that we are not as far down the road to true gender equality as we hoped we were. So we do have a great deal of work still to do. Uh, Kezia Dugdale raised the fact that today is Equal Pay Day. Uh, this is the day that marks the point in the year uh, where because of the pay gap for every other day of this year, women are effectively working uh, for nothing. Now in Scotland, and this is the good news, we are making progress in closing that gender pay gap. It's at 6.2%, which is still far too high, but it's lower than it was and it is lower than that across the UK as a whole, which stands right now at 9.4%. But we still got a long way to go. The Equal Pay Act uh, was passed in the year I was born. It is an absolute scandal that we don't yet have equal pay in this country. So we are doing a range of things from funding Close the Gap to trying to deal with some of the underlying issues like expanding childcare. We're also using the powers we have to try to create greater transparency around pay. So for example, we recently lowered the threshold for public authorities to publish their gender pay gap and equal pay statements from those with more than 150 workers to those with more than 20 workers. So these are some of the steps we are taking. There are others as well. But today is a good reminder for all sorts of reasons. And when it comes to the battle for true gender equality, much has been achieved, but there's still much to do. And I would agree with that. Uh, the reality is that in January, we will have a misogynist in the White House, a man who's boasted about assaulting women and has used the most degrading language possible. But today, we learned from EIS about the unacceptable level of bullying in our schools, including the use of sexualised and derogatory language right here in Scotland. What's more, 42% of our teaching staff have witnessed homophobia and transphobia in Scottish schools. So does the First Minister agree with me that these figures are alarming? And can I ask her what action the government will take to tackle bullying in our schools? First Minister. Well, we've given a range of, of commitments to the Thai campaign, amongst others, uh, that we will continue to uh, back efforts uh, and stand behind efforts and step up efforts uh, to make clear that there is a zero tolerance of bullying in our schools. That's particularly related, of course, to homophobic uh, bullying. But I was very concerned to read the reports this morning that teachers think uh, after the Brexit vote there has been an increase in bullying. And that is just a reminder to us of the responsibility we all carry to promote the principles of tolerance respect and diversity. There's a lot of debate, as there was in the aftermath of Brexit, about the reasons underlying the US election result yesterday. And there is no doubt whatsoever that many people feel economically alienated. I was talking about that in relation to Brexit just this week. And all of us have got a responsibility to oppose austerity and to address those issues. But what we must never allow to happen is those legitimate issues to ever give a veneer of respectability to racism, to misogyny, to intolerance generally. We've all got a responsibility to do that now, perhaps more than ever before. Yeah. 
And of course, Donald Trump's intolerance is not just aimed at women. We all remember the sickening sight of him mocking a disabled journalist. We can't forget his plans to build a wall or ban people of one faith from entering America. But I'm sure the First Minister would agree with me that Scotland is not free from that intolerance. We have seen reports of hate crimes against disabled people soar by 300% since 2010, and cases of Islamophobia have nearly doubled. The events of this week are distressing for those of us who believe in a society that is stronger together, who believe that we can achieve more working together than we can do standing apart, who believe that what unites us is far greater than what divides us. So does the First Minister agree with me that cooperation and inclusion can still trump the politics of division and isolation? First Minister. Uh, yes, yes, I do. It was uh, an irony, I think rather a sad irony, uh, that yesterday, as well as being the day we found out the result of the US election, was also the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, that, uh, I think, as well as many other aspects of the election result, made us all uh, very reflective. Um, I, I got some criticism uh, yesterday for having expressed my view of who I wanted to win the US election, uh, as <laughs> indeed had uh, Kezia Dugdale. Uh, but I, during that campaign, found uh, so many of President-elect Trump's comments to be uh, deeply abhorrent. And I never want to be, I am not prepared ever to be a politician uh, that maintains a, a diplomatic silence in the face of attitudes of racism, sexism, misogyny or intolerance of any kind. So I think it is important today uh, that firstly we hope that President-elect Trump uh, turns out to be a president very diff different to the kind of candidate he was and reaches out to those who felt vilified by his campaign. But people of progressive opinion the world over I think do have to stand up for those values of tolerance and respect for diversity and difference. Um, and you know, there is more of an obligation on us now than there perhaps has been on our generation before. Um, and this is the time to, for all of us, uh, no matter how difficult and no matter sometimes how controversial or unpopular it may be in certain quarters, uh, to be beacons of hope for these values that we all hold so dear. I have a constituency supplementary from Anas Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Figures published this week by ISD show that over 1,500 patients are trapped in hospital as a delayed discharge, cleared to go home, but unable to secure a care package. One of those patients is Janice Arundel. She is blind, has learning disabilities, and turns 59 on Christmas Eve. Her clearly emotional and distressed brother, David, came to my surgery to explain that Janice has been in hospital since November, having fallen and broken two bones in her neck. Janice was cleared to leave hospital in April and became a delayed discharge. As of today, she has now been waiting 209 days at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. It shouldn't take a question in this parliament to sort this, but sadly, it seems it does, despite the health secretary promising to eradicate delayed discharge. So what can the First Minister say to Janice, her family and the other 1,500 patients yep. and their families about this scandalous situation? First Minister. Uh, that is a completely unacceptable situation and I uh, would never suggest otherwise and I would expect the local health board uh, and the local council who of course now work together in an integrated joint partnership to uh, rectify that situation without further delay. Obviously I don't know uh, more of the details than uh, those that Anna Sarwar has just uh, shared with us about this case but from what he said it is completely unacceptable. Uh, on the wider issue of delayed discharge because it is an extremely important issue uh, principally because of the impact of delayed discharge on individuals, but also uh, because of the impact of delayed discharge uh, on the wider healthcare system. Uh, we have uh, taken a number of actions and continue to take a number of actions. I've talked about the integration of health and social care, something that no previous administration managed to do. We have done that. That is a step in the right direction. We are transferring resources from the acute health sector into integrated partnerships so that we can do more to build up social care services. And we are seeing progress in reducing delayed discharges. The number of uh, bed days lost from delayed discharge uh, have uh, decreased over the past year. The number of delayed discharges uh, 
are on a, a downward trend, although I want to see them go faster and more consistently downwards. So these are uh, real priorities for us that we are taking the action uh, to get the results uh, we want to get. Because what Anna Sarr has uh, reminded us of, and rightly reminded us of, is behind all the statistics uh, that we cite in this chamber lie human beings. Uh, and I hope the case he's mentioned, if he wants to pass the details to the Health Secretary, I will ensure that the Health Secretary uh, liaises with the Health Board uh, and with the local council to make sure that that action is taken. Question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Minorities across America are frightened. People across the world were horrified by the election of President Trump. I agree with the First Minister. That's why we all need to stand together for tolerance and compassion. This does show our democracy is precious and scrutiny of government is important. So at the risk of being accused of hysteria, I hope the First Minister will not mind me asking questions about the collapse of the Chinese deal. Well, the First Minister has criticised those before who've asked questions about this. Organisations like Amnesty International have concerns about one of the companies, Chinese state-owned CR3. She's today said that the deal is not dead yet. It's the f been a few months since the deal was signed. So has the First Minister carried out an investigation into their human rights record yet? First Minister. Uh, Amnesty International uh, rightly and responsibly uh, raised concerns uh, with the Scottish Government and uh, we have responded uh, to Amnesty International. Uh, that, if my memory serves me correctly, I will uh, certainly check that that is the case. We take concerns that are raised uh, of that nature seriously and carry out uh, proper investigations. The point I'd made previously about this memorandum of understanding, and I've made it again today already, the memorandum itself did not commit us to any investment. Had there been any projects coming forward, specific projects, full due diligence would rightly and properly have been carried out at uh, that time. Now, I've already said more widely today uh, that the government will reflect on any lessons we have to learn from this experience, um, and I hope that the opposition will as well. I, I say that not trying to blame anybody, but simply trying to uh, state a fact that when when something comes to an end uh, because of a political climate, I think we all have to ask ourselves how that political climate came about. And I, I simply say there is an irony in Willie Rennie's uh, question, or at least the preface to Willie Rennie's question, talking about the collapse of a deal. Willie Rennie is the opposition politician chiefly who has been demanding that we cancel this deal ever since he knew about it. So, you know, we will continue to take forward exploration of investment. We will do that responsibly and we will do that, of course, learning the lessons that we consider are appropriate from this experience. Willie Rennie. What the deal cancelled, because you hadn't even bothered to find out about the human rights record of this company in the first place. This is a dereliction of duty by this government. To so casually sign a memorandum of understanding with a company you know nothing about. What is the value of the First Minister's signature if it can so, be so easily dismissed, so easily binned, after no scrutiny? And the First Minister was incapable of answering my question. Has she done an investigation into their human rights record? I suspect not. She's not even bothered. Now, Ruth Davison was absolutely spot on. She's blamed everybody. She's blamed... This is, this is important stuff here. This is the performance of this government with regards to human rights. But Ruth Davison was right. She has blamed everybody else in this chamber for the collapse of this deal. But she hasn't even bothered to pick up the phone. Why didn't she even bother? If it was that important, surely it was worth a phone call. Surely she's responsible for the collapse of this and nobody else. First Minister. But I'm afraid Willie Rennie has to make up his mind. Either he wanted the deal cancelled, the deal to use his word, either he wanted it cancelled or he wanted me to pick up the phone to try to uh, retrieve uh, and to rescue it. He can't have it both ways. Now, contrary to what Willie Rennie has said, I, I think those watching will have heard me say on a number of times that, yes, I, I accept there are lessons for the government to learn about this, and we will reflect on those and learn those lessons. But when we have partners saying that the reason they feel they cannot proceed 
with investment is because of the political climate created. I think we have uh, the right to, to question who contributed to creating that political climate. That's what I am uh, doing in this case uh, and we will learn the lessons. All I'm saying is that I think opposition parties should perhaps reflect as well. A number of supplementaries. First from Gordon Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister has rightly condemned the brutal MOD cuts announced this week, including the Redford Barracks in the Collington area of my constituency. She will also have noted that two Highland Tory MSPs chose to ignore the closure of Fort George and their questions on yesterday's statement in Parliament. Unlike those Tory MSPs, will the First Minister confirm that her government will fight not only for the Highlands, but for all of the areas affected by these base closures? First Minister. Uh, yes, I was extremely angry uh, when I heard about the UK government's proposals about the defence footprint in Scotland. Uh, I should say these proposals were put forward with no consultation with the Scottish government whatsoever, uh, and they represent, if they go ahead, a 20% reduction of the defence footprint in Scotland. I, I think that is unacceptable. There are many communities, including in the members' own constituency, that will be badly affected uh, by these decisions. So I do think it's right that we oppose them that we seek to understand more about what the UK government intends to do to compensate communities uh, involved uh, and to stand uh, side by side with communities. Those on the other side of the chamber may not want always to do that, but those on this side of the chamber uh, will do. And I think uh, these proposals represent a government that seems to always be willing and able to find uh, money to invest in Trident nuclear weapons, but can't find the investment to safeguard our conventional uh, footprint here in Scotland. I think these are the wrong decisions. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In a response to a parliamentary question I tabled, the Justice Secretary, Michael Matheson, stated that Police Scotland have powers to move on unauthorised travel and encampments where there are exceptional circumstances, including vandalism, antisocial behaviour and encampments of six or more caravans. However, Inspector Colin Taylor from Police Scotland in the North East, which I represent, stated that there is nothing within the law that allows police to simply move on trespassers. From responses such as these, it's clear that the Scottish Government are saying one thing and the police are saying another. On the 21st of September, I wrote to the First Minister on this issue and I'm still waiting for a response. So can the First Minister please confirm to me now what steps the Scottish Government are taking to ensure that the police are aware of the powers that are available to them and feel comfortable enough in using them? First Minister. Well, I'm happy to ask the Justice Secretary to write to the member uh, to bring clarity to this issue. Of course, uh, trespass is not a recognised law uh, in Scotland, which is perhaps, I don't know, perhaps the reason behind the comments uh, that the member has cited. But it seems to me that the answer uh, that was read out there was uh, pretty clear. But I'll ask the Justice Secretary to contact the member uh, to answer any further questions that he's got about the matter. Marie Todd. To ask the First Minister for her reaction to the UK Government's announcement of the long-awaited new bidding for its Contract for Difference scheme supporting low-carbon projects. First Minister. Well, the decision that was announced yesterday is uh, deeply concerning. Uh, the UK Government, uh, after a great deal of delay, announced its decision on uh, Contract for Difference, uh, and there are two particular aspects of that announcement that are of extreme concern to Scotland. Uh, firstly, uh, what I can only describe as the betrayal of our island communities in terms of not treating uh, onshore wind developments in our island communities uh, as uh, an unusual form of energy and therefore able to bid into the auction for the contract of difference. That is completely contrary to commitments that had been given to our island communities uh, previously. And secondly, uh, not having a ring-fenced amount in this contract for difference for marine technology, obviously that raises uh, real concerns for world-leading projects like Magen. Uh, so we'll continue to liaise with the UK government. But again, just like uh, the one we've been talking about on the basing review, uh, this was announced uh, yesterday when obviously eyes were elsewhere without any consultation with the Scottish government. I don't think that's the right way to proceed, particularly when these decisions have such an impact on our economy right across the country. Question number four, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the impact on Scotland of the outcome of the United States presidential election. First Minister. Well, while the outcome of the US presidential election is not the one I had hoped for, it is the verdict of the American people. 
Uh, that said, I hope that the new president will reach out to those who felt marginalised and often vilified by his campaign and make clear that he will be a president for all of modern multicultural America uh, and also one who values the principles of tolerance, respect and diversity. The Scottish Government will continue to monitor developments during the transition period between now and January. We will fully assess the impact for Scotland once President-elect Trump forms a new administration and its priorities are made clear. Stuart Stevenson. On the 19th of November 1863 at Gettysburg, the founder of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln, said their nation was dedicated to the proposition that all are created equal. Can the First Minister agree that while the US President-elect's comments during the election barely connected with that proposition, he will have our support if he embraces in his acts and his thoughts Lincoln's statements as a proper foundation of what can truly make America great again and a great friend of us. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do agree with that. Um, I was struck yesterday by comments uh, made by the German Chancellor Angela Merkel when she said uh, she wanted to have a constructive engagement uh, with the, the new president, uh, but wanted that to be engagement uh, based on values of, of respect for all, of tolerance and of diversity. And I echo uh, that sentiment. Uh, the relationship between Scotland and the United States of America is a strong one. Uh, it is one that I believe will endure. So as uh, the elected First Minister of Scotland, I want to engage positively and constructively uh, with the American administration. Uh, but I will never, ever shy away from standing up for these important principles. And I very much hope we see a President Trump that is very, very different to the candidate Trump we have all been witnessing and many of us have been appalled by uh, in the past few months. Jackson Carla. Uh, no doubt uh, the First Minister will be urgently considering whether Mr Trump's election represents a material change in circumstances. Uh, Mr Trump has said that he will expedite a new trading relationship between a UK leaving the European Union and the United States. Given her direct intervention against the new White House, to which she has just referred, and her dismissal of the President-elect appointed by her predecessor as a business ambassador for Scotland, how will she ensure that this new potential trade, Scottish business and Scottish jobs are not prejudiced as a result? Well, I have to say, I'm not sure uh, if anything I've said about uh, Donald Trump even comes close to some of the, the tweets I was seeing earlier on from uh, Ruth Davidson that I believe have now been deleted from her Twitter account uh, about Donald uh, Trump. So... Um, Maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm misadvised uh, about that. Uh, but what I've just said is important. The, the relationship between the United States and Scotland uh, is a long-standing one. It's based on ties of family, of culture, of business. Uh, I want those ties not just to continue. I, I want them to be enhanced and to get even stronger. Uh, so as First Minister, I, I want to engage uh, with the next American administration just as we have uh, the last one. But, you know, I do believe it's important for all politicians at this moment in our history to stand up and be counted on important principles of tolerance and respect and diversity. And I'm not going to shy away from doing that. And I hope that Donald Trump builds an administration founded on these principles and if he does that we can continue to ensure uh, that that close relationship gets even closer in the future. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I feel we may have been here before but can I ask the First Minister what lessons have been learned following two Chinese companies withdrawing from a memorandum of understanding with the Scottish Government? First Minister. Uh, the purpose of the memorandum of understanding was to build relationships with a view to developing investment project projects in Scotland. Uh, while in August partners made clear to us that moving uh, forward at this time was not possible given the political climate, we remain committed to exploring investment partnerships with China and with other countries. It is a key part of the job of this government to secure jobs and investment, particularly at a time when Brexit puts our economy at risk. Murdo Fraser. Thank the First Minister for her response. The EY Scotland Attractiveness Survey shows that Scotland's record in attracting foreign direct investment projects from China is not as good as the UK as a whole. China is in the top five uh, origins for investment in the UK, but does not even feature in Scotland's top ten. Perhaps that's no surprise, given we've just seen what the Chinese have dubbed uh, Sc the Scottish shambles. So how will the Scottish Government improve its handling of deals with China so we can see greater Chinese investment here in Scotland? 
First Minister. Well, we'll continue to work hard to attract uh, more investment from China, as we will do from other countries. Uh, but it's interesting that Murdo Fraser chooses uh, to cite the EY report. I'm, I'm glad he's chosen to cite the EY report. Unfortunately, what he forgot to say is that report shows that for many years now, Scotland has been the most successful part of the UK outside of London for attracting inward investment. I think that's something to be proud of. Absolutely. It demonstrates the success of this government and our enterprise agencies in bringing investment and jobs into Scotland. That's now what's put at risk by the Tories' obsession with taking us out of Europe, and it's why it's so important we continue to do the job that we are determined to do. Question, question number six, Pauline McNeill. Presiding officer, to ask us to ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to reduce the number of children in temporary accommodation. First Minister. Uh, we know that the number of children in temporary accommodation has fallen since 2007, but it is still too high. Scotland's strong homelessness rights means families are in temporary accommodation while they wait for appropriate permanent housing. We want the time children spend in temporary accommodation to be as short as possible. That's why we'll introduce a cap of one week for families living in B&B type accommodation. And of course, we're fully committed to the prevention of homelessness and will deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes by the end of this parliament to ensure that vulnerable families have more housing options available to them. Pauline McNeill. Thank the First Minister for her answer. She'll know that households with children spend the longest in temporary accommodation, an average of 23 weeks. This Christmas, there are actually 591 families with children will spend their time in temporary accommodation, which Shelter have described as a scandal. The figure seems to be on the rise and doesn't seem to be decreasing. I'm sure she'll agree with me that the impact on children's health and education and well-being is affected by this. I wonder if the First Minister would consider, in addition to what she said today about the one-week cap for those in bed and breakfast accommodation, two further steps that she could take. Firstly, to consider strengthening the statutory duty in the 2014 Act, which gives reasons why families with accommodation should be housed as a matter of priority. But secondly, since she mentions the target of 50,000 houses, which I welcome, but will she consider ensuring there are some kind of conditions on house builders on the types of houses that we're going to build here with this target? For example, if we build more pensioner type houses, then that would free up family accommodation to house desperate families who need urgent action from your government. First Minister. Well, I'm happy uh, to give further consideration to both of those suggestions. Uh, firstly, in terms of amending the 2014 Act, uh, and second point about the type of housing, yes, although I would point out uh, to Pauline McNeill that it is already the responsibility of uh, local partners when they're putting together the strategic housing investment plans to consider the range uh, of different housing that is required in local areas. So that kind of planning already exists in the system and it's important uh, that that is undertaken properly. Um, I agree uh, with Pauline McNeill that we don't want any children living in temporary accommodation. The numbers have come down uh, since 2007, although uh, in terms of the most recent year we've seen a slight uh, increase. Uh, it should be pointed out, and I, I, I don't say this as, as any kind of excuse, but it is an important contextual point that uh, most temporary accommodation uh, in the so is in the social rented sector and is generally of a, a high quality. Uh, but nevertheless, it is not uh, good for children to be living in temporary circumstances, and that's why reducing the cap to one week is so important, uh, so that children get into permanent settled accommodation as quickly as possible. But the importance of our underlying ambition to build more houses is is a key part of the solution, so we'll continue to make sure we take the right decisions uh, to meet that target. Christine Graham. Oh, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the UK's callous cap on benefits and the predictions of thousands of children and families being thrown into poverty with the possibility of them being unable to meet rental payments, does the First Minister foresee further pressures on the accommodation, uh, the temporary accommodation for children and families, and how will the government cope with that? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. It, it worries me greatly. And in fact, some of the increase we've seen in temporary accommodation may, in some part, not exclusively, but in some part, uh, be down to uh, benefit changes in terms uh, to the extent that it's coming uh, from more people suffering homelessness. Uh, so it's important that we have the right frameworks in place, and that includes uh, the right support frameworks in terms of the benefit system. Some of the changes uh, that are in place uh, now in terms of 
uh, the reduction of the work allowance and universal credit uh, and uh, transferring some of the arrangements in the private uh, housing sector into public housing in terms of limits on uh, the amount of uh, housing benefit that can be claimed uh, are worrying and may well make this issue that we're talking about here worse. So that's why we'll continue uh, to put pressure on the UK government uh, not to do these things, but also as we take more, not enough, but more responsibility ourselves around some of these issues, we'll try to make sure that we've got the right systems in place. Question number seven, Maurice Golden. To ask the First Minister whether optional religious observance in schools for 16 to 18 year olds will support the values of a diverse, outward looking Scotland. First Minister. Well, religious observance is a school community activity which offers opportunities for young people to reflect uh, meaningfully on different points of view and values, including their own. It promotes critical thinking and helps young people become aware of different ideas and beliefs about life. The values of a diverse and outward-looking Scotland are fully supported by this aspect of school experience. Any decisions about a young person withdrawing from it should involve both parents or carers and the young person, especially as uh, that person, young person grows in maturity and understanding of their own learning. Maurice Golden. I thank the First Minister for that re response, but can the First Minister give an assurance to constituents of mine in the west of Scotland and beyond that within the parameters of any consultation or potentially amended guidance or legislation with respect to this, that there will be no threat to faith schools and how they choose to deliver education? First well, no, nothing about the consultation that has been uh, announced is about faith schools, and I absolutely uh, give that commitment. But we are, as uh, the member indicates, uh, looking at a consultation about uh, revising the guidance, which is principally around the issue that has been raised by the Humanist Society in the context of a court action, which is now uh, assisted, about whether young people themselves, uh, without the agreement of their parents, can withdraw uh, from religious uh, education or observance. So that's the issue uh, we're looking at. I think it's right as, uh, to look at that as, as young people get older, then clearly the responsibility for these decisions is enhanced. And uh, that, that is a position, of course, that already exists in England and Wales. So we're looking at that, but it is on that particularly narrow issue. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll now move to members' business, and I will take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.